Good afternoon, and today we have a pleasure of interviewing Dr. Ahmad Mahmoud. This is our first EMC on the channel. Good, after good afternoon, Dr. Mahmoud. Good afternoon. How are you guys? Happy yeah, to be we, here. We're so honored to have this opportunity. And Dr. Mahmoud, he's EMT who specializes in Inspire procedure. And besides that, he does a lot of procedures related to sleep apnea. And that's so valuable for our patients because, and for our listeners, because we want to make sure that journey uh, of addressing the sleep feel like a journey. It doesn't feel like, okay, I don't have any other way to address it. And we're going to talk in details about that. So, uh, uh, for our audience, if you know someone who have a bad night's sleep or sleep next to the snoring partner, please share information about our channel by clicking like and share button. This way, with our Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube channel, you can promote our mission of making this world a better place because well-rested person is definitely a happier person. So, welcome, Dr. Mahmoud. And I have a lot of questions for you, and I'm going to tell a little story related to my practice of sleep medicine. Yes, we have a lot of patients who got a CPAP machine from sleep doctor, and they try the CPAP machine, and with our myofunctional therapy practice, we try to help them to keep the mouth closed, to breathe through the nose, but sometimes they find it cumbersome. Okay, it's not a failure, it's a journey. The next step, they would be referred to us and we try to help them with oral appliance. But they find it difficult anyway, because you have to put it in every night and it's holding joy in a certain position. Or sometimes they just fall asleep and on the, next to TV and they forget to put it on. So the next step in our journey would be referral to Dr. Mahmoud or other sleep uh, boarded ENT uh, for Inspire procedure. My first question from my patients and my listeners who we absolutely appreciate, uh, Dr. Mahmoud, please tell us what exactly Inspire procedure is. Yeah, so the um, so the Inspire procedure is uh, it's an implant for sleep apnea. Uh, patients with uh, moderate or severe sleep apnea who can't tolerate the CPAP uh, or an oral appliance, just like uh, Dr. Sokolina mentioned. Um, it's a device that gets, you know, implanted in the chest area, um, kind of like a pacemaker. And there's a tiny little incision in the jaw uh, underneath the chin, I should say, uh, where it essentially functions throughout the night by keeping your throat open uh, with uh, a very small electrical stimulation with every breath. Um, and that's basically the idea. So it, it, it moves it moves your tongue forward just a little bit with every breath so that you don't have those obstructive events at night. Uh, when you're sleeping. Yeah, thank you very much. But I would like to know after, you know, you got that little, you know, electrical stimulator, uh, what happened afterwards? So when you get the, oh, so we get, you implant the device, it's, a, it's an outpatient procedure, and then you get a remote control. So you can, you know, turn the device on, turn it off when you go to sleep at night. Um, and that way you can control when it's working and, uh, typically when it's working, you're asleep, so you don't feel it. And, uh, it keeps, it keeps your tongue forward so that you don't have those apneic episodes. Uh, but, mm -hmm. yeah. but w what I implying, I would like to know how you exactly calibrate, you know, what amount of current or stimulus yeah. you need, uh, to be able to get a good night's sleep. You know, a lot of my patients, they um you know they want to understand after you got the procedure do they need another sleep study like we usually yeah. do with the CPAP or oral appliance or what exactly happened right right yeah so um it's not one size fits all i mean every patient's a little bit different it's uh there's uh there's a lot of customization and personalized programming that goes into each device uh, so that, uh, we make sure that it works for each individual patient. Every, every patient will probably need a different, uh, setting in terms of voltage and configuration, things like that. So the way we do that is, uh, do a post-operative sleep study in the lab about, you know, three or four months after implantation, make sure you can, you know, you can. And then, you know, we do, we do a sleep study in the lab where we actually customize, 
uh, while monitoring the sleep at night uh, and making sure that the, that the sleep apnea is, is totally gone, basically. Um, and so that's, that's something that we, you know, coordinate with our patients after surgery, basically. So the, the, that part uh, happened uh, during a sleep study, right? Correct. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the, the fine tuning and the titration to figure out exactly what setting works for each patient, um, that happens about three or four months after surgery. Yeah, thank you very much. But a lot of my patients, they want to know how painful it is. They can uh, yeah. speak about pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not, it's not painful. I mean, first of all, there's, when you're talking about pain, let's talk about two things. The first is the surgery. Um, the surgery is you have a little bit of soreness for a couple of days. You know, it's a, it's a skin incision here and a skin incision here. So those are going to be sore for a few days. Um, most people, honestly, just Get, do fine with some Tylenol and that's about it. Um, you know, every once in a while, some, you know, every patient's a little bit different, some pain medicine, that's okay. If you have to take some, that's fine. Um, then after the recovery period, now, you know, now you're using the device, uh, the device itself is not necessarily painful. In fact, if you're using it properly, you shouldn't even feel it at all. You should be completely unaware that it's even working or functioning. Um, some patients can get some soreness in their tongue, some soreness in their jaw, uh, but that's usually a sign of maybe they're using it too strong or you, they're using it on, on an incorrect configuration. So that's where there's a lot of, you know, that's where that customization comes from. And that's where that personalized approach comes in. Um, so that's usually when patients will call my office and say, hey, doc, you know, I'm, I'm waking up, my tongue's a little bit sore. Okay, well, come on in. We need to change the settings because that's not supposed to be happening. Um, when it's working properly, you shouldn't, you shouldn't feel it at all, really. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of my patients asking how soon they can feel a difference in their sleep. How soon after the procedure is done, you can start sleeping better? Yeah. So about one month after the surgery, I just want to let patients heal you're not actually using the device at all. It's, it's complete, it's in there, it's, uh, it's not doing anything. Uh, and then after that one month, uh, we activate the device, the patient gets the remote control and uh, they can start using it themselves at home. But it's also, you know, it's baby steps. Um, so there, there is uh, it, the, the tongue and the throat, they're muscles. And so like any muscle that needs a little bit of workout before it can kind of get fully up to speed. So, it's, it's a gradual process, uh, starting about a one, one month after surgery. And then, you know, usually by, by about six weeks after activation. So now we're talking, if you do the math, about 10 weeks after surgery, you're pretty much, you know, you're, you're, you're at the level where you need to be. Um, every patient's a little bit different. Some patients are, 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 you know, feel it right away. I have, I have patients that feel it, you know, two, two days after activation. Uh, I have patients that, you know, are a little bit slower and really only kind of get up to speed by about two or three months. Everyone's a little bit different, um, but it, it can anywhere. So to answer your question, anywhere from a month after surgery to three months after surgery is, is, is the answer. I first find out about this Inspire procedure, I would say six years ago when it just started. And I was so proud of the sleep medicine using you know, just like in a cardiology when they're using the pacemakers. And I think right. in neurosurgery, they use a lot of electrical stimulation as well. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of it is actually based on pacemaker technology. Uh, there is a, uh, and, and technically it is, it is a pacemaker. It's just not a pacemaker for your heart. It's a pacemaker for your tongue. Um, so it paces your tongue so that with your breathing, basically. Um, so it's the same, same idea. It's, you know, it's a tried and true technology that's been around for decades. Um, it's just now being applied to, to the tongue. Um, and it's yeah, working quite well. Yeah. Uh, very, very excited about, you know, that technology in the ENT, but I know, you know, some technical questions my patient always ask, tell me doctor, who would qualify for that procedure? Everybody who wants to say, okay, I don't want oral appliance or CPAP can have a Inspire procedure, but oh, there are some, you know, yeah. ways to so, find out. Yeah. So first of all, um, it, you have to have 
pretty bad sleep apnea. If you have mild sleep apnea or if you just snore and have no sleep apnea, then no, you, you won't qualify for the device. It has to be moderate or severe sleep apnea. And uh, what we're talking about is there's the apnea hypopnea index that is recorded for every sleep study, uh, 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 you know, also known as the AHI. Um, the AHI needs to be above 15 uh, in, order, in order to be a candidate, right? Um, uh, on top of that, there's, you know, some other restrictions. The, the biggest one is BMI. Um, BMI should not be over 35. Um, uh, interestingly, they're, they're actually, uh, look like they're going to loosen that up soon. Um, the FDA is reviewing cases now where, um, they might actually extend the BMI to 40. Uh, but until that actually gets approved, you know, 35 is, is, is the answer. Um, and a lot of that is actually, believe it or not, based on insurance, um, based on the, uh, based on the actual medical research and literature, patients might afford benefit, but unfortunately we're kind of limited by what insurance will cover. Um, so, uh, so that's why right now it's about, it's, it's around 35, um, assuming the AHI is, uh, so if you want to get set, uh, to simplify, if the AHI is over 15 and the BMI is under 35. You, you're 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 pretty much a candidate unless unless there's some my you know minor issue uh some unusual uh aspect uh to a patient and that disqualifies them but that's you know, patients will almost always be candidates basically yeah i would like you know i have two questions oh you disappear for some reason dr mahmoud are you with me hello doctor Oh, yes, sorry, yes, sorry. yes, yes, yes. Uh, I have another question based on your answer. Um, please tell me uh, insurance approval. A lot of patients are concerned about insurance approval. You know, you mentioned very well about BMI and AHI, uh, but what was your experience with insurance approval rates, even for people yeah. who have that, you know, qualifying numbers? Right, right. So, um, so the... Um so before we get to insurance approval there is so insurance so assuming we do all of the steps right uh, which obviously if my patients come to me we're going to do all these steps um the the bmi the ahi and then the, the third step is to do a sleep endoscopy for in order to evaluate the anatomy um because uh, the implant is not you know compatible with every single throat everyone's throat is a little bit different um, about 80% of patients have the correct throat configuration for Inspire. The only way we can figure that out though, and prove it is we have to do a sleep endoscopy where, you know, it's a, it's a sedation procedure in an operating room, put you to sleep for about five minutes, take a look with a camera in your throat, and then we figure out right then and there if you have the correct configuration for the Inspire. See, that's necessary because now I... And also insurance is interested in this, right? They don't we want to cover a surgery for someone that it's not going to work for. So getting to your insurance question, yes, it is typically covered by insurance, assuming you meet these criteria that I just mentioned. Uh, in fact, I have not had a case that was not covered by insurance. Um, you know, uh, if the, as long as the AHI is, cor is correct, the BMI is correct, and the anatomy on the sleep endoscopy is correct, um, you know, it's... Uh, it's, it's covered by insurance like any other surgery. Uh, you know, patients may still have a deductible as if they're undergoing any other surgery, et cetera, but it is, it is a medically necessary procedure that is, that is covered. And we do check with insurance companies and get prior authorizations and pre-certifications to make sure, um, you know, that there's no issues financially. No, that, uh, you know, financial part, you know, it's a comfort part for a lot of people. But I have a challenging question for you. People, you know, concern, I know about DICE procedure and that concentric collapse. Is anything can be done for people who have a concentric collapse, who yeah, anatomically no. not qualify? How, you know, can you do anything, you know, what other remedies can be done for somebody who are not qualified to make right. them qualify? Right, right, right. Yeah, so um, you mentioned concentric collapse. I mean, that's 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 the uh, that's the the phrase of patients who are disqualified from Inspire. Um, concentric collapse refers to an actual, you know, uh, here on the camera, like a circum uh, circumferential or a circular collapse, where as they're breathing, that's you know, it narrows down like this. Okay, 
about 20% of patients have a throat that narrows down in a circular fashion. Inspire doesn't work very well for that, okay? Um, there actually are research studies right now um, to see if it can be adjusted. Um, so I anticipate in the future, actually concentric collapse will be gone. Um, uh, you, uh, project for that right now, um, but we'll talk about that another time. Uh, but for most patients, about 80% of patients have what's called an anterior posterior collapse. Uh, let me see if I can get on the camera here, where the throat kind of collapses in a front to back fashion. Mm -hmm, okay? mm -hmm. That's the collapse that we want for Inspire because Inspire opens things this way. It doesn't mm -hmm. open things this way, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and that's how it works. So for patients who have a concentric collapse, um, it's not the end of the world. So there are alternative surgeries. Um, uh, palatal surgery is an option, also called a UP3, uh, or you know the, the proper term for it is a uvula palatal pharyngoplasty. Uh, it's a very long word, which is why we just call it palatal surgery. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but the idea there is we you know we remove tonsils if you have any, um, and then we also remove the palate uh, or parts of the soft palate, I should say, and parts of the uvula in order to open up the throat. Um, that surgery does two things. Interestingly, um, the first thing that it does is it opens up your throat so that it could potentially get rid of your sleep apnea. Um, the other thing that it does is it actually converts your throat from a concentric, uh, pattern to an anterior posterior pattern, right? So you see where I'm getting here. Um, yes. if, uh, and so if it turns out that the surgery does not get rid of the palatal surgery, I mean, does not get rid of your sleep apnea, well, guess what? You can still potentially qualify for the Inspire because now you have the right shape throat. Um, it, uh, I can't guarantee that it works that way for every patient, but in my experience, it, it has worked that way for every patient so far. Um, so it's not the end of the world. It's, it's kind of the more uh, scenic route uh, to getting to Inspire for patients who still need something. So it's um, it's almost like Inspire now or Inspire later if the, you know, if, if the patient still wants it. Um, so that, that's, that's usually the other option. Uh, I really like how you put it because I want my patients to feel hopeful, but there is always, we can find together as a team between dental field and the medical field and my functional therapy field in, you know, other specialty, what are actually our audience, we would like the patient to feel what there is a hope and we're going to find that, you know, step, what's going to make them feel better. And I think. My next question would be kind of in a both way, like number one, we really appreciate our audience. And if you have uh, questions for Dr. Mahmoud, please put in the chat box who you are, where you're coming from and your question, and we definitely find you the answer. Uh, this way we can create that, you know, two way communication. Uh, then now I have kind of multi layer question. Sure. As you know, I'm, with, I'm a big proponent of myofunctional therapy. Mm -hmm. And it would relate to another question I have, the myofunctional therapy, how do you feel it would fit into ENT, ear, nose and throat collaboration world? Like what ENT philosophy towards that physical therapy for tongue and uh, throat and uh, nose breathing and lips together? Please help us because a lot of myofunctional therapists or people who believe into that concept puzzle how to create that seamless pathway to do what they have to do to make sure they satisfy ENT, you know, doctor with their service. And in the same time, of course, patient will benefit. Like it's a general question, but if you can give us practical guidelines. Well, so, you know, when you're talking about myofunctional therapy, I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, the proper way to breathe at night, right? So um, uh, we as humans are, uh, are we're designed to breathe through our nose. Um, yes, you can you can breathe through your mouth, but that's 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 a fail safe. That's a backup option. It's not ideal uh, for many reasons. It dries out your mouth. Um, you know, it can develop to a lot of cavities. Uh, you know, dentists can tell you more about that than I can. Um, but it can also cause you know uh, throat pain, uh, throat discomfort, uh, irritation of the tonsils, things like that. Um, so it's not ideal. 
Um, so we want people to breathe through their nose because the nose humidifies the air, it warms up the air, it's better for your lungs, it's better for your throat. Um, and so that's part of the process. You know, I have I, I have a more holistic approach to uh, to sleep apnea. I mean, at the end of the at the end of the day, um, sleep apnea or or better yet, uh, sleep obstruction, sleep disorders uh, at night start anywhere from the nose all the way down to the lungs. Um, so you know, the Inspire works really well for the throat area back here, but it doesn't do anything for your nose. Um, and so. Uh, before we proceed with any Inspire Im uh, implant or even the palatal surgery that I discussed, um, something that I always make sure is our patients breathing through their nose properly. Um, uh, are they have are they do they have chronic sinus infections, uh, recurrent sinus infections, allergies that are poorly controlled? Do they have a septal deviation, uh, turbinate hypertrophy, adenoid hypertrophy? Um, these things are all going to be a problem for breathing in general. I mean, there's no, there's no point in me doing a surgery that's going to open up your throat if you're not breathing through your nose. You're still going to be pretty miserable at night. Um, and so that's part of the first process. Uh, you know, before we, before we jump to Inspire or before we jump to palatal surgery with every patient, I always make sure I do, do, a, do a nasal evaluation. Are you breathing through your nose properly? Is the anatomy of your nose correct? Um, uh, because actually, believe it or not, so there are, there are patients, this is, this is quite rare. It doesn't happen for everybody, but there are patients where, you know, you do a surgery to fix their nose and suddenly they're breathing really well and their sleep apnea gets better. Um, and those patients, Hey, guess what? You don't need Inspire. You don't need something, you know, something more extensive afterwards. We fixed the problem in the first shot. Um, so once we can improve their actual nasal anatomy and nasal function, um, the next step is kind of where the myofascial stuff comes in so that we can make sure that patients are now using your nose, right? You know, I just, I just gave you a nice Lamborghini, but now you got to learn how to drive it. No, th this is a great answer because what I notice in my practice or some of my colleagues, um, yes, uh, people go to ENT uh, and they have a lot of wonderful things, but they don't have a function. They don't know how to function. It's kind of like a programmed. So if you, th th that was my question and I'm going to repeat it again. If you can give a practical advice, how to create a conversation between ENT doctor and myofunctional therapist, what they can start referring to each other. What would be the suggestions from the trenches? That's a good question. Um, I, I guess it would be um, if there are any anatomic problems, um, you know, or, uh, or chronic inflammation or chronic allergies, then yeah, that's where an ENT should be called in to, you know, fix it, uh, with, with surgery or with, uh, or with, uh, allergy treatment, things like that. Um, but once it's, you know, once the anatomy is restored, once the, uh, the normal func uh, functionality of the nose is restored, then, you know, and, and if you have a patient who's still struggling to breathe through the nose, then that's kind of where I think the myofascial comes in, um, where we say, okay, you know, it's everything, you know, the plumbing works. Now we just gotta, you, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta learn how to use it. Um, so uh, I think that's kind of the symbiotic relationship there um, that can that can work out pretty nicely. No, absolutely right. Like I would like basically if my functional therapist or doctor like me who practice my functional therapy for the practice want to you know, create a relationship with the ENT. Basically, we just keep approaching with education to ENT practice. I guess that would be the answer because a lot of my functional therapists ask me that question. They yeah, try yeah. to fit in. They try to form symbiotic relationship, but yeah. It, you well, know, well, I'm, I'm spoiled. I have you to work with, so I'm 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 already well educated. <laughs> no, that's 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 a good answer because in a way, I want to make other people you know, to create those relationships. I think they're going to benefit the patients. But now, you know, we appreciate your time and we don't have much. I would like to ask you, what other sleep-related procedure, if you can go over in a short term, what other things you do to make people to sleep better in related to ENT surgery? I know you kind of briefly mentioned, yeah. but I want you to talk Sinus, because it's usually, for me, it's right, a good right, right. sinus, deviated septum, turbinate. Like, what specifically you do for all these areas? Correct, right. 
So um, if uh, it all depends on what the, what abnormality the patient has, right? And it can be a number of different things. So the, the most basic and most common is, let's say a patient has a septal deviation, either they had a fracture at some point or, you know, what, something of their nose. Well, we fix that because, you know, that can really obstruct um, the nose. So we do, we do a septoplasty, which is an incision inside the nose. Um, it's not a visible surgery. It's outpatient surgery, uh, about a one week recovery. Um, uh, other things are sinus issues. That that's probably the second most common. Um, if people have chronic sinus inflammation, that's you know transitioning to their nose. It's creating a lot of obstruction, opening up the sinuses. That also can help as well. Um, and uh, and then you know turbinate hypertrophy, adenoid hypertrophy, even the nasal valve collapse. You know the nasal valves are this side of the nose here. When you breathe in, when you breathe in at night, sometimes for a lot of people, you know, this collapses, and so they can't breathe. That's that's where breathe right strips come in. Uh, you know, a lot of patients love breathe right strips, but guess what? You got to put them on every night, um, and if you use them over and over again, they can create a lot of irritation from the adhesive. Um, so there's there's a surgery that we do where we do a nasal valve correction or a nasal valve repair in order to help um, you know maintain that good open nose. Um, so that's the, those are the things that we do, and and um, this kind of can get bundled a little bit with you know with an Inspire patient. Um, is uh, you know remember I mentioned that sleep endoscopy that I have to do for every patient. Um, for me, the way I do it is while I'm doing the sleep endoscopy, I already have the patient asleep in the operating room. I will also do some, whatever I need to do to their nose to improve their nasal breathing. So you kind of kill two birds with one stone there. Number one, I'm, I'm improving the nasal breathing. This is assuming a patient has a problem, obviously. Um, uh, number one, I'm assuming uh, I'm, I'm making sure they're breathing through their nose properly. And number two, I'm also evaluating whether they'd be a potential candidate for the Inspire in the future. Um, yeah. I have a last, last question. Yeah. Why, in your opinion, a lot of sleep apnea patients have a chronic sinus infection do you have your philosophical answer to that that is an interesting question um uh the i don't know what if uh, if uh, you know there is definitely a correlation there's a high correlation um i think uh my theory about it is that patients with sinus problems are are or they notice the sleep apnea more, uh, if that's a better way. There's actually, uh, you know, only uh, only one percent uh, of, of people who, or sorry, only ten percent of people who have sleep apnea actually know they have sleep apnea, right? And uh, that means that ninety percent of people with sleep apnea don't realize it, right? Um, those people are probably otherwise breathing through their nose just fine, and so they don't notice it as badly, right? But it, for, it's the people who have the sleep apnea and the sinus problems, I think, that uh, that notice it much more because they're miserable at night. I mean, not not only not only are they waking up tired from the sleep apnea, but they're having difficulty falling asleep because their nose is obstructed, right? So they're feeling it on both ends, going to sleep and waking it up. So I think the reason why we're seeing such a big mix of both is simply because those patients tend to be the most miserable. I don't know. I'll give you last thing. According to my observation, because they're breathing through the mouth and nose doesn't get aerated, it's like a garbage that's true. clothes. That's true. And yeah, that's yeah. why, you know, the sinus get inflamed with all the garbage coming out and yeah. post nasal yeah. People are really suffering from yeah. that. Yeah. That, that, to that, that is true. The nose, the nose likes to breathe. Uh, and actually, that is, that is a well, well established thing. If, 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 so if you're not breathing through your nose, your nose actually will, will, will have stasis of mucus, will have built up with things so yes that is that is also very true i like that expression that's gonna be my like slogan now nose like to breathe we really appreciate you dr mahmoud would you find the time in your busy schedule to talk to my audience we're looking forward to have you again you know and because you 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 have like a, such a vast amount of knowledge and we really enjoy and i hope my patients would enjoy your presence on a lot of you know addressing a lot of problems thank you very much my pleasure my pleasure thank you so much for inviting me on